in days like these, with the COVID-19 crisis in many of our countries, it's difficult to know where things are going. It's difficult to have confidence in the long term, let alone for the next couple of weeks or next couple of months. My wife, Jackie, and I served as missionaries in the south of Italy for 21 years, and Italy was hit hard by this virus not too long ago. Now it seems like places like Brazil and the United States are hot spots. And when we consider our own personal futures, we often struggle to know where our confidence can come from. And that's true for our churches as well. Where do we get confidence to know that God's work is in good hands, that God's work will continue, that we can have confidence for the future? And that's what I would like to look at with you starting today and next week as well, as we consider God's work and how he has set it up, how he has designed it so that we can have confidence in it for the present and for the future. And that's important for us as we consider where our churches are today and where they'll be. We want to look forward knowing that God is in control and we have hope for where he is taking us. And as Jackie and I step into the role of the general secretary this fall, we look forward to guide, um, guiding these churches and, and our leaders with our mission of mobilizing and multiplying disciple-making churches, knowing that God has our churches in his hands, that he is leading us and guiding us, that he will provide for us. And we will see some of the principles today in the Old Testament, and next week we'll look at the New Testament to continue in our journey together. But what I'd like to invite you to do today is start by opening to Deuteronomy chapter 3. And we're going to look at an example of a time in Israel's history, Israel, the people of God in the Old Testament, a time when there was a leadership transition, a time when there was a generational transition. It was a new day for God's people. Uh, the context is that God's people are standing in the Transjordan. They're on the east side of the Jordan River, about to cross into what would be known as the Promised Land, the land that God had promised to them from long before, from days when they were slaves in the, in the land of Egypt. And that journey to this day should have been a short journey. But if you begin reading at the first chapter of Deuteronomy, you find out that an 11 day journey takes 40 years. 40 years because of the doubts of a generation. Uh, God had said that he had given them the land that they were about to take in the, the verses that we're going to read today. But the generation that God had spoken to 40 years previously upon sending spies upon checking out that land had returned with a negative report a report of doubt doubt that god could actually bring them into that land because of the obstacles in this case the giants in the land the giants that they would have to overcome and as a result of their doubt as a result of rejecting god's promise they would wander in the wilderness for 40 years. 40 years is the time it would take for that generation to cease. And so it's a new day. It's a new generation. And Moses is standing with the people of Israel on the east side of the Jordan. And in verse 12 of chapter 3 of Deuteronomy, he writes, when we took possession of this land at that time, I gave to the Reubenites and the Gadites the territory beginning at Aror, which is on the edge of the valley of the Arnon, and half the hill country of Gilead with its cities. The rest of Gilead and all Bashan, the kingdom of Og, that is all the region of Argob, I gave to half the tribe of Manasseh. And so we see already God has given 
begun to give land to his people. Moses describes here a territory that has been given to two and a half out of 12 of the tribes of Israel. And then he continues in verse 18 saying, and I commanded you at that time saying, the Lord your God has given you this land to possess. All your men of valor shall cross over armed before your brothers, the people of Israel. Only your wives, your little ones, and your livestock, I know that you have much livestock, shall remain in the cities that I have given you until the Lord gives rest to your brothers as to you, and they also occupy the land that the Lord your God gives them beyond the Jordan. Then each of you may return to his possession, which I have given you. So here is Moses speaking to two and a half out of 12 of the tribes of Israel. And he's basically saying, okay, great. You have your land. You now know where you will live, but the job is not done yet because your brothers and their, their families have not also been able to take the land that God will be giving to them. And so leave what you have for now, but your job is not done. You're coming with us. You're going to cross over the Jordan with us, and you're going to help your brothers complete the task, and then you will be able to return and enjoy the land that you have. And so here we find the first principle related to our confidence in God's long-term plan for his people. And that is that individual gains, while important, are not as important as team gains. We can celebrate individual gains, but ultimately we don't celebrate until the team wins. That's what God uh, God is saying through Moses to his people at this time. He's saying, fine, you have what I promised for you, but it's not just about you. It's about my entire people, about the entire um, people of Israel. We might state this differently by saying we win as a team. Now that sounds familiar, doesn't it? When we get over to the New Testament, where are some passages that you can think of that communicate this principle that we win as a team? There are a number of passages that come to my mind when I think about that. Early in the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles or the Spirit of God through the Apostles, where uh, Christ has left and the Apostles are now unleashed to begin the the church a couple thousand years ago. We find the church meeting together in homes, and we we know that they were uh, together to uh, study the apostles' teaching for prayer. They ate together. They donated their goods, and and they shared so that, as um, it says in Acts chapter 4, No one had need because the apostles had enough to distribute to those who were in need. And so we see this principle that we win as a team right away in the life of the early church uh, after Christ has gone, as the apostles get going. As everyone bands together and learns and grows and celebrates the Lord and uh, meets needs together. Where else can you do we see this principle in the New Testament? We see it in places like Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. When Paul is talking to the church about spiritual gifts, um, Paul teaches us there that all of us have a spiritual gift. Every single person who belongs to the body of Christ has a gift, and that gift exists to edify or to build up God's body. In another passage, Paul will describe the body of Christ similar to a human body, and in doing so, emphasize the fact that 
every part in the body has an important function. That the head is no more important functionally than the toe. We may have different um, different reasons for existing. We might have different ways that we express our value, but each one of us is important and we all come together and work as a team. And there are other passages as well. One of those we'll look at next week is Ephesians chapter four that talks about how the body is edified uh, as we are equipped and as we all work together to edify the body. So that's the first principle that we see today that allows us to have confidence in God's work. And that is that we win as a team. We also win as individuals, but the overall goal is that we contribute to the good of the whole. The second principle we find going back to this passage in Deuteronomy in these verses and starting in chapter 21. And I commanded Joshua at that time, again, this is Moses speaking, your eyes have seen all that the Lord your God has done to these two kings. So will the Lord do to all the kingdoms into which you are crossing. You shall not fear them, for it is the Lord your God who fights for you. And so not only is our confidence found in the fact that we win as a team, that we stick together and together we celebrate collective wins, but also the fact that fear cannot win when God fights for us. As I mentioned earlier, Fear was the reason why one generation was punished, and Moses is speaking to their children. Fear is what caused the spies who originally examined this land to encourage Israel at the time not to follow through on what God was telling them to do. Now, there were good reasons for fear. Those giants were real. Uh, there's a land theology going on here. There were people that inhabited the land that God had promised to Israel. Those were people that had an opportunity to submit to Israel's God as Israel had. As God said to Abraham, his generations, his um, descendants would be a light. They would be a testimony to the nations. Those nations had heard of Israel's God. Those nations had heard of how Israel's God had brought Israel out of Egypt, out of slavery, across the Red Sea. Those nations had heard how Israel's God had helped Israel to defeat Pharaoh and his armies. And those, Israel, those nations had a choice. They could submit to Israel's God or they could refuse to submit and they could stubbornly stand up to Israel's, uh, to, to God's people, Israel. And that presented the occasion for Israel to fight those nations, and those nations would be defeated, and those lands then would be given to Israel. Now, there would be another time few, uh, further ahead where Israel itself would lose that promised land because of disobedience to God. But what we see here in this land theology is that God gives and God takes away. God has the right, God is the creator and he is the ruler of the universe and he, he gives and he takes as he sees fit. And uh, the people in these lands had stood up against God, that the evil in these lands had reached a point at which it was going to be punished, and God was going to use his people, Israel, to do that. And so that meant that Israel had a reason to fear. There were battles to be won. There were giants to face. And so Moses encourages them by reminding them that it is the Lord 
your God who fights for you. Now, it's interesting to know, not only if you go back in, in the first chapters of Deuteronomy, do you find out that it took, that an 11 day journey took 40 years for the people of Israel. But you also find out that it wasn't just Israel who was fighting giants. Israel's relatives, the people of Edom, uh, Esau's descendants, um, Lot's descendants had also been given land by God. And they had fought those giants and taken that land. And Israel would come through their land. And now it was Israel's turn. And the question would be, will God's people be obedient? Will they finally face those giants? Will they finally take the land that God has given to them? And so Moses encourages them. It is God who fights for us. So fear is reality, and fear is reality for all of God's people. Fear is certainly a reality in my life. When I think about my own um, tolerance for risk, uh, it's not very high. I'm not a very adventurous person by nature. Uh, I tend to desire to obey God. Sometimes I put myself in places where I know that I need to be to obey God, and, and then I'll face the challenges that I'm going to face when the moment comes. And I've seen God be faithful time and again. But fear is definitely a reality for me. As I think about making disciples, I think about engaging people in conversation in an increasingly intolerant society in which we live. Intolerant, um, intolerance is not expected in many areas, but when it comes to Christians, intolerance is still accepted in society. Uh, Christians are seen as closed-minded or often seen as, as very narrow in, in their focus as they come uh, expressing the good news of the gospel, that Jesus died to save us from the sin that plagues each one of us in humanity. And that offer of salvation requires a response on our part, a response of accepting the free gift of salvation that none of us deserve and none of us can earn. And yet that message is often seen as, as uh, unaccepting of other messages, and it is because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And so as we go out with this message, we may go out with fear, knowing that it's not going to be readily accepted by many people that we encounter. We know that our eyes are blinded by the enemy, and we often don't understand spiritual realities if God doesn't do a work in our life. But when we go as ambassadors of that good news, knowing that we're going to have difficult conversations, we may be gripped by fear. And so it's important that we remember that God fights for us. Jesus, in leaving the Great Commission to his disciples in Matthew 28, said, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And behold, I am with you always. Jesus knew that we couldn't do this on our own. He knew that we couldn't make disciples of others on our own. And he promised his presence with us as we go. And so as we think about God's work and as we consider where our confidence comes from in God's work. We can consider that we don't fight alone. We fight as a team. But not only do we fight as a team, God fights for us. And then the final uh, principle that we find is that God's mercy reigns 
in spite of the limits of our mistakes and our mortality. Because as much as we might be inspired by the fact that we're in this with others and the fact that God fights for us, in spite of the fact that we might commit to, to stepping up in ways that God wants us to be obedient, he wants to use us as his children, each one of us knows, don't we, that we're not going to do that perfectly. That there are going to be days where we're more obedient than other days. That there are going to be times where we fall short of who we are in Christ. Where we have opportunities that God places before us that we're going to be unfaithful in fulfilling. And so what about that? Should that remove or undermine our confidence in God's work? The work that he chooses to get done through people like you and me? The good news is that God's mercy reigns in spite of our mistakes and our mortality. Those limits are no match for God's mercy. They're, and they were no match for the mistakes and mortality, even in the life of, of a faithful servant like Moses. Let's read the final verses uh, together that we're going to look at here in verses 23 to 29. So Deuteronomy chapter 3, verses 23 and 29. And I pleaded with the Lord, this is Moses again, at that time saying, O Lord God, you have only begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do such works and mighty acts as yours? Please let me go over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, that good hill country in Lebanon. Now, this is an interesting request. And when I read this request, I first, my first response, and maybe this is what you're thinking, is to remember a time when Moses was disobedient to the Lord. In Numbers, um, Moses Numbers chapter 20, Moses was leading God's people. And there was a time where people, the people grumbled against the Lord for lack of water. And God promised water. And he instructed Moses very clearly how he would get water. And Moses, in, instead of following God's instructions, he decided to do things a little differently. Now, the, the outcome was the same. But God's displeasure in Moses was expressed in the consequences that Moses would face. And God said, because of that, you will not enter the promised land with your people. And so it was interesting for me to read these verses of Moses pleading to enter the land. Didn't he know the answer? Didn't he know what the consequences were? And yet I also remember times where God's servants pleaded with God to change his mind, let's say. Uh, we know God doesn't change his mind, but God had expressed intent to do something and they pleaded with him not to go through with it. I can think of a time where Abraham was in Sodom and Gomorrah and he said to God, uh, because God had said, I'm going to wipe out those cities because of their evil. And what did Abraham do? He said, God, if there are 50 people, what if there are 50 righteous people there? Are you going to wipe it out? And God said, if there are 50 people, I will spare it. And then it went down from there, 10, and, you know, and in the end, it was just Lot and his family and that those cities were destroyed. Or there were times even when God's uh, patience had run out with Israel. We probably remember those occasions. It was Moses himself who pleaded on behalf of Israel. And the reason why he pleaded with God was to spare his people because God's 
patience had run out with them and he was ready to wipe them out. And Moses said, don't do it, Lord. What will your reputation be with the surrounding nations? Think about your own glory, Lord. And, and the Lord was pleased with those requests. And, Mos and he relented of his intent to destroy his people. And so as I thought about that, I thought, what's going on here? What's going on with Moses making this request? Is this an appropriate request or not? Moses was imperfect. He's like every other servant of God, imperfect in carrying out the plan that God had had for him. But in this case, we know how God felt about that request. He says, but the Lord was angry with me because of you and would not listen to me. You know, the, the reality is it was Moses' mistake, but there is truth in the fact that Israel um, provoked Moses to anger. In Psalm 106, uh, the psalmist tells us that Israel bears some responsibility. And whenever anyone leads God's people, there is shared responsibility. But God says, the consequences are clear. And he says to him, enough from you. Do not speak to me of this matter again. And so God's consequences are clear. Moses has made a mistake and he will pay for the responsibility of that mistake. He will not enter the promised land. But what happens in these verses is of tremendous encouragement to me because it doesn't end there. God says to Moses, go up to the top of Pisgah and lift your eyes westward and northward and southward and eastward and look at it with your eyes. For you should not, shall not go over this Jordan. Now Pisgah is a mountain range on the east side of the Jordan. And friends who visited there said, sometimes you go up that mountain range, can't see anything because of the humidity or the clouds, but God is saying to Moses, go up to that mountain range. You're not gonna go in, but I'm going to show you. You're going to be able to see the land. Well done, faithful servant. You have brought the people to this place. And no, you didn't do it perfectly, but God is encouraging, I believe, Moses here by saying, you've completed the job, completed the task that I asked you to do. And you can see, I'm going to show you the promised land. No, you're not going to go in, but you brought the people this far. You've gotten the job done. And he goes farther by saying, but charge Joshua and encourage and strengthen him, for he shall go over at the head of this people and he shall put them in possession of the land that you shall see. So we remained in the valley opposite Beth Peor. And that's the second part of God's encouragement. No, you won't go in Moses, but you have a successor who will take the people into the land. And so God reminds Moses that he has provided another leader, that his work will go on, that there is reason to have confidence. And so what we see today in this passage here in Deuteronomy 3 are three reasons why we can have confidence that God's work will continue, that it's in good hands, that God's sovereign care will continue in the life of the work that we're engaged in. We are in this as a team. He's put us with brothers and sisters in Christ in the local church, and together we fulfill God's uh, desire for us to edify, to build up our local church as each one of us plays our part. Secondly, uh, we don't have to fear. There might be many reasons for fear, knowing our own limitations or the obstacles ahead of us, but God fights for us. And finally, that in spite of our limitations, in spite of our mistakes, Limits like mistakes and mortality are no match for God's mercy. 
that God will take what we offer as imperfect as it is, and he will use it to accomplish his work for his glory. You know, the bottom line for me in this passage is that God didn't bring us this far only to leave some of us behind. And as you consider this morning your part in God's work, I want to encourage you. Maybe you're at the beginning of your journey and you are just learning about what it's like to live for the Lord. You're just discovering what the church is all about, how he brings people into his family these days through this idea called the local church that he created and he designed. This started with Christ and his apostles and continues on and spreads and expands throughout the world today. God didn't bring you this far only to leave you behind. Jump in, uh, offer to serve, to find out where your gifting is. Uh, Ask others to equip you to, to teach and to study God's word, to interpret the scriptures, to lead others to Christ, to do ministry in the local church. Maybe some of you are on the other side of the spectrum and you've been doing ministry for many, many years. Maybe it's time to pass the baton. Maybe it's time to mentor someone else. None of us are immortal. And God's work continues through generations. Maybe it's time to begin to identify younger men and women in the Lord who you can mentor, who you can walk alongside of to give them greater confidence. That will be your way of helping God's work to go forward. All of us are called to make disciples. And we can do that knowing that Christ is with us. He left us this uh, great commission, and he will continue to accompany us as we do our task. Next week, I want to continue to look at this idea of God's work and the confidence we can have in it. Uh, through another passage, a passage in the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 4. Thank you for this opportunity to be with you today. It's been an awesome journey for Jackie and me as disciples, as disciple makers, learning what it's like, becoming church planters, doing that in the nation of Italy, raising our family there. And I'll tell you a little bit about that next week. But Let me just pray for all of us as we go today. God didn't bring us this far only to leave some of us behind. I pray that you'll be encouraged as I am today, that God has a place for each one of us in his work. And we can be confident in the work that he is doing and jump in and commit ourselves with obedience to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for this church in Sao Paulo, Brazil. We thank you for the multi-generational leadership that there has been there through the years. We thank you for the, the prospects for growth that are there in the future. And even in times of doubt and uncertainty, like the crisis, the current crisis has brought in, And even in times where there's been a change of of generational leadership, we can have confidence in the work that you're doing. And we can just be so grateful that you've brought us into your people and that you've got a place for us to play in carrying out the work that you would have us to do for the benefit of our local church and the church around the world. So I just pray that you'll lead us and guide us this week, that you'll encourage our hearts and give us uh, eyes to see the opportunities and the ways that you're calling us and that we would step up in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great Sunday, everybody. See you next week.